It's such a great honor to be with so many great conservative leaders. I want to thank Steve for his leadership. I want to thank Ralph Reed for his leadership nationally. It's a great honor to be here with my friend Ted Cruz, who does a great job for us in Washington, D.C. More importantly, it's such a great honor to be here with each and every one of you. I want to thank you for what you're doing for fighting for conservative values. I also want to thank you. We've heard from a couple of great candidates tonight. I don't know about you, but I'm excited when I will re-elect Terry Branstead as a governor of this great state. I had the privilege of spending much of my day making phone calls on behalf of Joni Ernst and the rest of the ticket. You know, it is going to be great to have somebody who served us in uniform in the United States Senate. We need to elect her because she's going to do a great job for Iowa, but I have to admit, it's going to be nice to fire Harry Reid from his job as reporter. Well, you know, I was in Washington, D.C. yesterday, and it's such a relief to get here to Iowa and get out of that city. I've got to tell you, I've been in D.C. now five different times. And it's a very funny city, but I think I finally figured it out. First time I was in D.C., I was an intern. When you're an intern, there's no job too menial, too low, uh, too, too uh, demeaning for them to give the interns. I was a low man on the total. I came back a second time in the private sector and enjoyed my time in D.C. I came back a third time. Then I was the executive director of the National Bipartisan Commission on the Future of Medicare. And we were literally on the verge of coming up with a bipartisan solution to strengthen and reform Medicare. How sad that the president at that time, Bill Clinton's inability to control his lust, actually doomed our chances of getting a plan in the Congress. Came back a fourth time as assistant secretary in the Bush administration. It was a great honor to work for President Bush, but I also got to see firsthand the waste of the federal government in D.C. But the real experience was the fifth time. You see, I got elected to Congress. And boy, is that a different experience. You get there, and it really explained me a lot of what's wrong with Washington, D.C. That's when you get the secret code. That's when you get the key to the secret doors. Because when you first get elected to Congress, they give you a member. And that's a great thing. That means you can go in all those secret corridors. You can go to any building, anywhere you want. Then they give you a license plate. And it has H and a number on it. It's a very special license plate. You see, you put it in your car, and they tell you you can park wherever you want. One day I was surfing in the Rainbird building, I couldn't find parking. A Capitol Police officer walked out and said, Congressman, what are you doing? I saw the curb says no parking. I can't find anywhere to park my car. I'm just looking for an empty spot. He said, well, Congressman, those rules don't apply to you. You park your car wherever you want. That's why you've got the special license for it. Then they give you a voting card, and you get to go on the floor. Your staff doesn't get to go. Your children don't get to go. Your spouse doesn't get to go. Only you get to go and use your voting card. They give you a bunch of money to run your office. They tell you you can hire or fire anybody you want. And here's the thing. When you get elected to Congress, your jokes get funny. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. You get smarter overnight. I told my colleagues you should try this, and I'm, I'm just... I'm bad if I did try this. I said, I want you tomorrow morning, go to your office. I want you to say the dumbest thing you can think of. Because I guarantee you, that group of lobbyists, that people that are coming to try to, to get your vote, they're going to find a way to agree with you. So I would literally go to my office and make up, I would say, you know, I woke up today and I saw the sun rose in the west. And these people look at me and go, Congressman, that is the smartest thing I've ever heard. I saw the sun rise in the west today. Maybe the biggest lesson I learned was, you see, I, I actually lost my first election. People ask me, what was the difference between losing and winning an election? Here's the difference. When you win an election, you've got a lot more friends than when you lose an election. <laughs> when I won my election, there was a state official who had endorsed my opponent. He'd gone on TV, he campaigned against me, he worked hard against me. And so when I got elected, he came to see me. He said, Bobby, I was secretly for you from the very first day. <laughs> I said, you know, I'm new to politics. I really don't understand what that means. I said, next time, I want you to be secretly for the other guy and publicly work for me. 
But I think this explains why so much is wrong with Washington, D.C. It's not really a window in the real world, and that's why it's so important for our members to get out of D.C. as often as possible. I've actually got an idea. I'm not sure my former colleagues would like this, but we pay our state legislators a per diem. I think we should start paying our members of Congress a per diem, but instead of paying them for every day they come to D.C., pay them for every day they stay out of D.C. You may remember a few years ago, Bill Clinton was running for president. He made famous the slogan, thanks to a Louisiana guy, it's the economy, stupid. His point was that economic concerns are really all that matter. Look, the economy is important. He won his campaign, but I think that's a very flawed view of America. Every political strategist tells their candidates, focus almost exclusively on economic issues. I disagree. They think the key to a strong America is economic strength and our democratic system of government. Here's what I believe. As America's culture goes, so goes America. <laughs> Not it's the economy stupid, rather it's the culture stupid. Now don't get me wrong, I'm all for capitalism, I'm all for strong economy. But capitalism and free economy, capitalism and free enterprise will fail in a country where people don't respect the rule of law, don't care for each other, don't share a common view of the dignity of all mankind as God's creation. Culture matters. Don't get me wrong, in addition to loving capitalism and free enterprise, I love democracy. But even democracy will fail in a place where the collective intentions of the government are bent on selfishness, greed, lawlessness, or subjugating others. <laughs> democracy only works when it can rely on the bedrock foundation of a culture where people share a common commitment to doing the right thing and playing by the rules. Otherwise, democracy would simply become the will of the mob. American success relies on a healthy culture. A culture that admits some things are right, some things are wrong. A culture that respects life, honors the dignity of every individual, and honors the values of our Judeo-Christian ethic. There's no magic to the free enterprise system. There's no magic to democracy or even our mighty military that can't be undone by men behaving badly. You've heard it said before that liberty cannot be established without morality, nor morality without faith. Now, of course, this is an unfashionable sentiment in today's society. Many want us to believe that a completely secular society is a desirable goal for America. But they don't seem to realize that our culture is sick. Capitalism, democracy, and even military might will not save us. The countries of Western Europe have already weakened themselves by adopting a secular worldview which pushes matters of faith to the side. I've got no interest in seeing America go the way of Europe. So for me, it's not the economy stupid, it's the culture stupid. And that brings me to what I really want to talk to you about tonight. You see, there are many things that worry me about President Obama and what he is doing to our country. You've heard many speakers tonight talk about the nearly $18 trillion of debt. You've heard him talk about Obamacare putting bureaucrats between you and your doctor. You've heard about the EPA smothering our economy. You've heard about the new rules and regulations, the new borrowing, the new taxes. And certainly there's a lot that troubles us in what this president continues to do. But a lot of that can be reversed with a conservative leader in D.C. What worries me even more than all that is what this president is trying to do to change the definition of the American dream, an important part of our culture and our country. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, if you listen to his speeches, if you watch his actions, you can see this president's working very hard to change with the American dream that you and I grew up wanting about. This president seems to believe the American dream is about a larger, more expensive, more intrusive federal government. He seems to believe it's all about redistribution. He's trying to make the government more involved in our lives. He's trying to manage the slow decline of a once great economy, a once great country. He's trying to make us more and more like you. I don't know about you. That is not the American dream my parents taught me and my brother about when we were growing up. I don't know about you, but my parents taught me about an America that is forever young. An America where we are promised not equality of outcomes, but equality of opportunity. 
An America where the circumstances of your birth don't determine your outcomes as an adult. An America where our best days are ahead of us. An America where we live in an aspirational society. You don't have to be born of the right parents, the right zip code, the right gender, the right race, or anything like that to do great things in our country. How many moms and dads have told their little boys and girls, anybody, anybody, can be the first in our family to go to school, to start a business. Anybody in the United States can grow up to become President of the United States. Now, unfortunately, we found out how true that was in 2012 and 2019. <laughs> but I argue that we must fight to preserve the American dream for our children. You see, every generation of Americans has left more opportunities to our children than we inherited from our parents. We must not become the first generation of mortgages in our children's future. Now, part of the reason this is so important to me is my parents, my family, they have lived the American dream. My dad is one of nine. He was literally the only one in the entire family to pass the fifth grade. Grew up in a house without electricity, without running water. I know, because we heard these stories every single day of our lives. For all those fathers, he used to walk uphill going to school, uphill coming back from school as well. You asked him for an allowance, he wanted to charge him room and board. But here's the great thing about my parents' story. Nearly 50 years ago, nearly 50 years ago, my parents came from halfway across the world to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. They came in search of the American dream. And by the way, when they came, they came legally. I've got a simple message for the president, and it's not complicated. We don't need a comprehensive bill. We don't need a thousand pages. We don't need speeches. Mr. President, it is past time for you to do your job, secure the border. Once and for all, get the Think about something. When my parents came, there was no internet. They'd never been on a plane. They had never been to Louisiana. They'd never even met anybody who had been to Louisiana that could tell them about the weather or the food or the people. But they knew where their bones. They knew if you could get, if you could work hard, there was freedom, there was opportunity. You could provide a better quality of life for your children and your grandchildren. They landed in Baton Rouge. My mom started her studies at LSU. My dad, he didn't know a soul. They were living in married student housing. They were running out of money. He wanted a job. He didn't want to have Opened up the yellow pages. Started calling company after company after company. Now, I don't know if it took him weeks or days or how long, how many hours he spent on that phone, how many times people hung up on him. Finally, he wears a guy there. Finally, sight unseen, a guy from a railroad company says, Sir, I'm so impressed with your enthusiasm. He said, you can start Monday morning. I love the next part of the story. So my dad tells his new boss who he's never met before, by the way. Well, that's great. He says, now look, I don't have a car. I don't have a driver's license. You're going to have to pick me up on the way to work Monday morning. <laughs> boss was so taken by his enthusiasm, he did just that. Six months later, I was born in a woman's hospital. I was what you would politely call a pre-existing condition. <laughs> now, I didn't predate their marriage. They was just, there was no Obamacare back then. I just predated their insurance coverage. I was born at a woman's hospital back in the same hospital where two of our three beautiful children were born many years later. And by the way, many of you have asked, the third child, our last child, that was a little slave. That was the one who was born at home. Now, I don't recommend that. We didn't do that on purpose. First child took 36 hours, second child took 24 hours, third child took 30 minutes. <laughs> you know, I learned a couple of things. I, I won't tell you the whole story, but I will tell you just a couple of things real quickly. The first thing I tell you is every man here, you need to go home, you need to thank your moms, your wives, your daughters, your sisters. There is a reason God Almighty in His infinite wisdom does not let men have babies. <laughs> If it was up to us, then there'd be one baby, there would never be another one again. 
The dumbest thing I ever heard, I was in church the very next week, and the guy came up to me, he read about it in the newspaper, and he said, Bobby, the exact same thing happened to me. It's going to be the same thing. He goes, well, I have me a kidney stone that's exactly the same thing. <laughs> I said, that's the dumbest thing I've heard. Most was a nine-pound kidney stone. It is not the same thing. <laughs> the second thing I've learned is that, you know, babies, when they come out, they don't look like when they come out on TV. They're all pink and beautiful. You know, they come wrapped in a blanket. It's not how it works in real life. I've been married to my beautiful wife 17 years. We first met in high school. She was the very first girl I asked her. She told me no, but she was the first girl I asked her. <laughs> 17 years of marriage, I lied to her exactly once. And that was after the birth of our child. See, our baby comes out and she asks me, she can't, she's screaming in pain, she's on the floor of the bed, it's just the two of us. There's no ambulance, there's no doctor, no nurses, no paramedics. The baby comes, and by the way, everybody comes and congratulates me. All I did was catch the baby. I didn't do anything. She did all the work. So the baby comes out and she asks me, what does it look like? <laughs> now, if I was being strictly honest, what I would have told her was, he doesn't look like he's done. Let's put him back in there for a little while. Sweetheart, he looks like your side of the family. Doesn't look like anyone else. <laughs> but you see, I like being married, so I told her he's a beautiful baby boy. Ten fingers, ten toes, he looks great. I will tell you this. We've had two children before. This was our third child. But my wife, she had been in pain. She was on the floor. She felt uncomfortable. And I remember when I gave her our third child a hold for the first time. She forgot she was on the floor. She forgot her discomfort. She forgot her pain. When I saw my wife holding our child for the first time, when I saw the bond between mother and child, I fell in love all over again with that beautiful, beautiful woman I first met in high school. I just wish she had said yes when I asked her the first time. <laughs> but going back to my parents' story, so I was born in a women's hospital. They don't have insurance. I love what my dad does next. He's in this country only several months at that point. This is what he does. He doesn't apply for a government program. He doesn't sign a contract. And by the way, when we had our children, we had insurance. It took us hours to fill out the paperwork. My dad just went and he shook hands with the doctor. He said, I'll send you a check every month until I pay this bill in full. Two men standing alone in a hospital just shaking hands. That's the way you got things done. That would work today. I asked my dad. It was a simpler time. I asked my dad. I said, "How do you pay for a baby on labor?" <laughs> I said, "If you skip a payment, can they take the baby back? What do they do?" He tells me, "You were such a bad little baby. I would have skipped a payment if I could have sent you back." <laughs> he said, "But don't worry. You're paid for. Nobody's coming to take you away." The reason I tell you that, I'm reminded about something Mark Twain said. He said, "The older we get, the smarter our parents." You know, I don't know about you, my experience has been that he's exactly right. I hate, I hate the fact that every day I'm turning into my dad more and more and more. I hear things coming out of my mouth that I hated hearing as a child, but I say to my kids all the time. My dad used to tell my brother and me, for example, if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? No idea what that means, I say to my kids all the time. My dad used to tell me, well, son, you don't live in a democracy. As long as you live under my house, under my rules, you live in a dictatorship. You've got to do exactly what I tell you. Didn't like hearing that? Tell my kids that all the time. But there were two other things my dad told me that I didn't really understand until I grew up. The first thing my dad would tell me is he'd say, son, I'm not leaving you a famous last name. I'm not leaving you an inheritance. But I am going to make sure you get a great education. He said, if you work hard, there's no limit what you can accomplish in this great country. And here's the second thing he would tell us. He'd say, sons, he'd tell my brother and me, he would say, every night, you need to get on your knees. You need to thank the Almighty God, you're blessed to be born in the greatest country in the history of the world, the United States of America. I didn't really understand what he was trying to teach us and why that was so important. 
point, everybody had to use their own. What does that mean? Now that I've got three young kids, I know exactly what he's trying to teach us. Every generation has left more opportunities for our kids than they inherited from their own parents. And it's now our turn to make sure we leave those opportunities for our children instead of more to the future. I thought long and hard about what I could talk to you about tonight. There are many things we've done in Louisiana that I'm proud of. We have cut our budget 26%. We have cut 28,000 state government jobs, largest income tax cut in our state's history, strongest private sector economy in a generation. We have passed pro-life bills year after year after year to maintain our number one rating as the most pro-life state in the country. We have passed the strongest... <laughs> some of the strongest Second Amendment protections, but here's what I want to talk about briefly tonight. We have worked hard to give every child in Louisiana the chance to get a great education. And it's pretty simple. It's not complicated. We know that every child learns differently. Some children are better off homeschooled. Other kids are better off in public schools or in Christian schools or parochial schools, online programs, dual enrollment programs, charter schools. Every child learns differently. So we've done something very simple. We said instead of making the child follow the dollar, we'll let the dollar follow the child. We will trust parents. You wouldn't think this was controversial. We've saved the taxpayers tens of millions of dollars. Academic scores are getting better. Highest ever graduation rates. And the amazing thing is you hear from moms. It's the first time my child's bringing home homework. It's the first time my child is actually thinking about going to college. It's the first time my child is going to a school where there's paper in the classroom, pens in the classroom, supplies in the bathroom. The first time my child's wearing a uniform and feels safe. Yet millions of kids are trapped in family schools thanks to the extreme left. In our state, a union leader got up and said, parents don't have a clue when it comes to making choices for their kids. Well, this is the same left that doesn't think we're smart enough to buy our own health insurance, to own a gun, or to exercise our religious liberty rights. We fought and won this battle in the legislature and in court, and here is our reward. Eric Holder and the Department of Justice took this to federal court to try to stop our student choice program. And by the way, how sweet it is to hear that Eric Holder is about to be out of the job. I love what my little boy did. He got all the answers right there. When he came to the second half of the test, 
For example, when he said, show, draw the diagrams wise, but 18 plus 40 plus 22, he wrote for every single one, the present is. I know the common core experts say I'm supposed to fuss at him. I just couldn't. I told him he was right broadside and play. I told him, good job. How did we get to the point where the federal government thinks it's their job to dictate curriculum, it's their job to stop kids from getting a great education? Well, I would actually argue that I actually agree with something David Axelrod said. He was trying to defend President Obama after one of the many, many, many scandals. I don't even remember which one of those so many scandals. And he said this in defense of the president. He said, the president couldn't possibly have known what was going on. He said the federal government is so vast, so expansive, there's no way the government, there's no way the president could have known what was going on. You know what? He's exactly right. The federal government is too vast, it is too expensive. You may remember in the 90s, Bill Clinton famously said the era of big government was over. Well, never before has something been so wrong about something so important in our modern political history. You know, if I could go back in time several years ago and stand in front of you, you probably wouldn't even believe some of the horrors we've witnessed in our own federal government. If I stood before you and said, would you really believe that we'd use the IRS to after conservative groups? Would we have believed that our government would do that? No. If I could go back in time and say, would you really believe that we run up the debt to $18 trillion, nearly $18 trillion, would we have believed that? No. If I could have gone back in time and said, would you really believe the Department of Justice would get guns into the hands of black Mexican drug cartels through fast and furious, would we have believed that? No. If I would have gone back in time and said, would you really believe they're going to create a new entitlement program and we can't afford the ones we've got today, would we believe that? No. If I would have gone back in time and said, when our ambassador in Libya was killed, they would try to blame the YouTube video, would we have believed that? No. If I could have gone back in time and said, then our then Secretary of State Clinton would have been so exasperated, she would have told the Senate when asked about this, what difference does it make? Would we have believed that? No. When you look at example after example, maybe this is the scariest. If I would have gone back in time, I would have asked you, would you really believe that our own federal government would wage such an assault on our religious liberties here in the United States of America? Would you have believed that? No. You know, I was glad, I don't know about you, I was glad the Supreme Court decided the Green family didn't have to pay over a million dollars a day in fines simply because they didn't want to use their own money to buy abortion patients for their employees. Weren't you glad that the Supreme Court got that right? Here's what I don't understand. Why was that a 5 4 ruling? Why wasn't that a 9 0 ruling saying that religious liberty still exists? United States of America. You see, when Secretary Clinton, when President Obama, when they talk about the freedom of religious expression, they mean you've got the right to worship the way you want Sunday morning, Wednesday night, and that is it. That is not religious liberty. That is not what the Founding Fathers intended. The reality is, without religious liberty, there's no freedom of speech, there's no freedom of association. You know, we like to say that President Obama is a smart man. We like to say he's a constitutional scholar. I'm not in favor of lawsuits. I passed court reform in my state to crack down on frivolous lawsuits. But you know, I've actually found a lawsuit I'm willing to endorse. This president spent three years at Harvard Law School. It's not clear to me what he learned while he was there. If I was him, I would sue Harvard to get his tuition money back. I think he didn't learn a darn thing by law school. You may have seen during the recent controversy of the Duck Dynasty, one of the first people to defend Phil Robertson was the governor of Louisiana. Now, you may have thought I did that simply because the Robertson family is from Louisiana. And that's not why I did it. You may have thought I did it because they're personal friends, and they are, but that's not why I did it. You may have thought I did it simply because my boys are such big fans of the show. And that's true. <laughs> By the way, isn't it nice to be able to watch the show together as a family where you don't have to worry about the language or the images you see on TV? <laughs> 
The reason I stood up for Phil Roberts was pretty simple. I'm tired of the hypocrisy of the left. They tell us they're for tolerance. They tell us they're for respect. The reality is this. They're for tolerance unless you have the temerity, unless you have the courage, unless you have the audacity to disagree with them. They are such hypocrites. I don't know about you, but I am tired of it. It is time to draw a line in the sand and tell the left enough is enough. I really do wish that the President of the United States would hear at least one thing we have to say tonight. And this is such an important issue. You see, the United States of America did not create religious liberty. Religious liberty created the United States of America. That's why it was so odd. You may have heard at the National Prayer Breakfast, the President speaks so eloquently about the plight of Christians being persecuted overseas. He was eloquent and he was right. There is a shooting war on religious liberty overseas. It's not a shooting war at home. It's a silent war here at home. It is a shooting war overseas. But it was such an odd juxtaposition. Yet again, there was a Grand Canyon-sized gap between this president's rhetoric and about what he's actually doing here at home in the United States. He was speaking eloquently about religious liberty even after he goes after religious liberty rights here at home. Or if you didn't happen to hear his remarks, to summarize, this is what the president had to say. The president is worried about religious liberty. If you like the religion, <laughs> you can keep your religion. Now, before I close, I do want to mention this very briefly. In addition to his assault on religious liberty and the growth of the federal government, it is very disturbing to see how this president has mishandled foreign affairs. This may be, during the 2012 election, I came to Iowa and I went all over the country saying that President Obama was the worst president since Jimmy Carter. Now, after the election, I actually went back and I apologized to Jimmy Carter publicly. So I don't want to fair to Jimmy Carter. I truly think that President Obama is the first president in our nation's history who does not believe in American exceptionalism. a president who insists on leading from behind. This is a president who dithered, and while he dithered, ISIS got stronger, and because he dithered, America is at war and at risk, and we are less safe because of his inability to act, his, his lack of decisiveness. This is not a new thing. He refused to stand with Israel unequivocally when they wage their battle against Hamas, the terrorist group. He has created uncertainty in the Middle East and all over the world. We know for a fact Putin and Russia would not be in Crimea, they would not be in Ukraine. They truly respected and feared the occupant of the White House. Our enemies don't fear us. Our friends don't trust us. Leading from behind is not leadership, Mr. President. America plays an indispensable role in the world. You know, after the often tragic beheading of Foley, the first American reporter, the president was eloquent as always. He spoke about our nation's grief, but grief is not a strategy. You know, when he talked, he talked about expelling ISIS from Iraq. He talked about containing ISIS. What he never said was, we need to hunt them down and we need to kill them. <laughs> Only recently, at least the President's rhetoric, at least he finally understands that there is evil. At least he's beginning to say that he recognizes there is evil in the world. The problem with this president, though, however, is he seems to seek multilateralism as a goal, not a tactic. Mr. President, we cannot allow the foreign capitals of the world to have veto power over American foreign policy. America must lead. We must defend our strategic interests, our people. We must understand whether he thinks we're at war or not. Radical fundamentalist Islamic terrorists have declared war on the United States of America, whether he wants to admit it or not, whether he wants to call it what it is or not. We do have the greatest military in the entire world. We have the freest people in the entire world. We need a president who's not embarrassed about American exceptions and understands this simple truth. A stronger America leads to peace in the world. It's not a slogan, it's not a cliche, it's the truth. I know it's not very sophisticated to most citizens of the world in the Obama administration. 
But you know what? Sometimes truth isn't sophisticated. Sometimes truth is just simple truth. It's time for the President of the United States to become the leader of the free world and understand America truly is the greatest country in the entire world, not just one on two. You know, I've talked to you tonight about many things the federal government has done about going after educational choice, religious liberty, and making a mess out of our foreign policy. I'll close with one final question. As I consider the Obama administration, it makes me wonder a very simple question. And this is a tough one, I'll warn you. I've wondered whether it is true we are witnessing the most ideologically, extremely liberal administration in our lifetimes. Or whether we are witnessing the most incompetent administration in our lifetimes. The only satisfactory answer I've come up with this is to quote Secretary Clinton. What difference does it make? <laughs> well, I do want to leave you with this final thought. This is why I started the importance of Terry's election, Joni's, and these other elections. I'm a complete optimist about the future of America. Our best days are still ahead of us. My dad was right to teach us to get on our knees every day to give thanks to God Almighty we were born in the greatest country in the world. But it's not inevitably so. Our 40th president reminded us that every generation has to choose for itself to renew those principles of freedom. And now it is our turn. Now it is up to us to make sure our children can get on their knees and thank God Almighty. And here's the good news. The greatness of America is not in D.C. and our government and a bunch of fancy buildings. Our founding fathers got it right. The greatness in America lies in the freedom they entrusted their mothers and fathers, that they entrusted to entrepreneurs and small business owners creating something out of nothing. If we are willing to stand up and fight, I sense there is a rebellion movement in these United States of America, where the free people are ready for a hostile takeover of Washington, D.C. from our political leaders, not incremental change, but big change, so we can restore the American dream for our children and grandchildren. God bless y'all. God bless the race.